Good afternoon. All right, it's around 1.40, and that's the time when our general session uh, restoration for pollinators is starting here. So I'm Stephanie Frischi. I'll be moderating this session, and I would like to introduce our first speaker. We have Tracy Etwell with the Canadian Wildlife Federation, and she's going to be presenting a novel approach to developing pollinator right-of-way habitat in Ontario, Canada. Welcome, Tracy. Everyone hear me there? Great. Um, so yeah, my name is Tracy Atwell. I'm with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. So I hail from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. So for anyone who's not familiar with uh, Canada and geography, that's our capital city. And it's about um, an hour and a half flight from here, really quite close. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about our uh, Rights Away Habitat Restoration Program that we've been running for about two years now. No downs. Pardon? Big green button, yeah. Oh, okay, that's why. <laughs> okay, so just a bit about Monarch. I'm, I'm sure this crowd is really familiar with Monarch and the uh, marvel of the migration route. Uh, so just gonna cover a bit about monarchs in Canada. So um, you'll see that sort of light brown in the middle, the north central. So that's this, they estimate about 17% of the monarch comes from that region. So that's all around Great Lakes. Obviously the, the US and Canada both have uh, sections of that habitat. So that's where this rights of way program initiated, was looking at what we could do to improve the monarch habitat um, in Ontario. So just to give you a sense here, uh, this is obviously all of the US states and all of the Canadian provinces. And uh, this is an estimate of how much of the monarchs originate in the, these different areas. So if you look at uh, that province of Ontario, which you may not really be familiar with, but it's sort of that dark orange in the middle. And so they estimate between five and 10% of the monarch come from this range. So it is kind of kind of significant. It's very close to Texas in terms of 5.8. So there is a significant role that we can play. Could be like a backup population if things go down in the south, if the population isn't in great. So we're also interested in insect declines, as everyone probably knows, the uh, studies and the research coming out about insects declining across the board. So habitat loss, urbanization, agricultural practices, climate change, these are all things that are happening in Canada as well as here that are impacting the monarchs. So what can we do? We can work on these, restoring these wildfire rich meadows and managing those that still exist on the landscape. And we're interested in this sort of landscape approach, giving the monarchs lots of places to diversify across the landscape. So we come to rights of way, so some people may be familiar with this term, but it's like anywhere there's like a roadway, transmission line, pipelines, even solar properties now, are places where we can put in this pollinator habitat. And the nice thing is it's being managed already. In many places, you can't have trees and shrubs. In the case of power lines, you, that's a safety issue. So they already want low growing vegetation, so it's a really great win-win uh, location for this habitat. So you may not know this, but Canada has over a million kilometers of roads and other rights of way. This is sort of a, a broad scale estimate of all the places where this habitat could exist. So just some uh, high level conservation things that are related to Canada. So we've got a number of commitments that we've also made. The Global Biodiversity Framework, 30% of degraded land to be restored by 2030. The Bond Challenge, so of this 350 million Canada has committed to 19 million hectares. So that's a pretty significant challenge. We figured out a demand of about 95 million, million kilograms of native grass and welfare seed. So Canada currently only produces about a tenth of this. So this program had kicked off our native seed strategy, if anyone had seen Stefan's presentation. So we started with this program and then we realized we didn't want to do this right to way work all across Canada. We really don't have the seed for it. So that's where that came from. And then also on the tree side, we have a federal commitment of uh, 2 billion trees. 
and we're a little bit further ahead on the tree side, but we still don't have as, enough seed for the tree part. And then we also have a trilateral agreement on Monarch between the three countries to try to work on population conservation. So then we bring us to our project, so starting in 2022, still ongoing. So we're working with the land managers themselves to restore this breeding habitat. So we're doing active and passive, so we're looking at places where we can actually go in, till the soil, put uh, seed in the ground, and grow those forbs and grasses that we want to see. And we're also working with these people with uh, passive restoration. So places where we can change the business as usual. So when I say business as usual, that's usually mowing and spraying everywhere frequently. So where we can identify places where that kind of effort can be reduced to keep more plants on the landscape. So we started in Eastern Ontario and it was so successful, now we've gotten more money to go down into Southwestern Ontario. So just to give you some more geography, so um, where Ottawa is, is it's in the center of the Eastern Rights of Way area. And then we've moved down to the Southwestern Rights of Way area. And the little tip at the bottom of that uh, Southwestern area is actually Point Pelee, which is a very, very famous crossing for monarchs. So both in the spring and the fall, they congregate and hang out in the trees there and then cross the lake. So thousands and thousands of monarch will cross that lake. And then they come up in the spring, they travel along the lakes, we think, and then find different breeding habitat in these areas. And they can go all the way up to uh, North Bay, which is sort of the, if you made a line from the top of the Eastern across to the lake, that's sort of the range. And I have another map I'll show you for the range. So uh, part of this work is, like I said, working with managers. So we are giving advice how to do this restoration. We're telling them about seed mixes. We're actively interested in boosting the market of what's available uh, to have these high diverse mixes. Um, in the upper right hand, you see that bin. We're trying out some trials with mycorrhiza powder where we're putting that in the soil or within the seed to see if we can boost uh, the germination and also reduce the weed pressure because we are on roadsides, there's lots of disturbance. So we're kind of trying to see if we can improve this. And then these are just some pretty pictures of the roadsides with the granite Susan, but that's one of the first plants that comes out. So it's really nice for the public to see that. Uh, then they get excited and think that this can be a beautiful uh, approach to the sides of the roads. So something we did in particular was a community of practice. So we wanted to group all these people doing this work together. We didn't want to just be the ones telling them this is how you should do things. We wanted them to take ownership and develop their own projects and teach each other and learn from each other. So that's the peer support part of things. We have a funding grant as well, so they can apply to us for money for seed, for install, even if they think they need long-term maintenance money. We can help them with all that. We do a number of training resources, so we do webinars. We have uh, fall field visits. We'll go out and look at sites and talk about what worked and what didn't. And we share best practices. And then we have a number of resources that we've developed, like on the right side, you see the native flowers with St. Lawrence lowlands. Uh, that's a list of all the species they could pick from for that area. Then we have, like I mentioned, the webinars and the workshops and a number of uh, guides and documents that they can refer to as well. So all of this work is connected to the US Rights of Way Habitat Working Group, if anyone's aware with that. So a lot of the great work that's being done with the Monarch CCA. So this is modeled after that. So we're working on creating the Canadian chapter of that group. Um, and so we really enjoy that partnership. So this is an example of something that we developed as a resource training um, product for the manager. So we took all of our iNaturalist app data of where people see Monarch in Canada. So that dotted line it, it expresses the range where monarchs travel in Canada. And we were attempting to give them some kind of guidance about mowing. So if they could make changes to their mowing regime, it would keep more monarchs on the landscape. So uh, this is an example of something they could use. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that, that their whole area that they're gonna adjust that, that mowing practice, but maybe they'll pick a certain road, have a pollinator uh, road that they designate and uh, change their uh, practices. And you also see some different colors, so that kind of represents where the monarchs 
travel, so it takes them longer, obviously, to get up to the higher elevations, and then they will move down again in the fall. So as I mentioned, we're big on the peer-to-peer, -peer. so this is one uh, training that we put on last year. So we had uh, connections with New York Power Authority, so some of their uh, great work with um, in integrated veg management. So they came up and met with our Hydro One, which is our Ontario Power Authority, and taught them about all the different uh, procedures and changes that they've made, both for pollinators and wildlife in general. And it was really, really successful. They really um, liked relating to each other. You know, they have specific challenges and things that they deal with in the fields and with their organizations. So uh, we're hoping to do more of this. And we also have the webinar, and we're hoping to go and share it with other different uh, power authorities in different places. So something else we're big on is monitoring. So we're using the pollinator scorecard that was developed by the Rights of Way group. And um, so there's my happy face doing my monitoring in my different sites. Uh, so we're trying to use that so that we can compare among different sites. We could also potentially compare it to American sites too to see uh, what's going on. And the other thing that we did a little different with our project is uh, pollinator sampling. So we've got uh, Gilles Miranda in the corner there. He's an entomologist, so he goes out and he samples the same sites that I've been to, and he uh, collects the insects and to see what's using those habitats. So the idea is that we'll get a sense over time which ones are best for pollinators and what is the advice we can give different rights-of-way managers about how to provide those habitats. And it's, it's quite interesting because we're seeing a lot of diversity. We're seeing specialist pollinators, generalist pollinators, some come out at different times of year, and then depending on what the climate is doing, you know, if it's a, a drought year or a really wet year, we're gonna get different uh, communities. So that's been really interesting. Here's another example of a uh, product that we've developed. So this is a, a milkweed in Canada graphic. So as far as I could, uh, I could look around, I couldn't find anything that really was really illustrative of what milkweed species we have across the country. Um, there's some vague lists and old documents. So we created this document, went through all the, the provinces and listed which species of milkweed were found. Um, so this is also something we could use for the Canadian Rights of Way Network to have different people identify what province they are and what milkweed species they could plant and grow. Um, you'll see that arrow there. So common milkweed is our most common species in the Ontario province. So. Uh, that's a good thing. They seem to really like that. Uh, they will also like the uh, butterfly milkweed and the swamp milkweed. So those are two common ones in our area. We're also trying to see if we can go back out and inseed butterfly milkweed and swamp milkweed in some of these sites. See if we can boost the biodiversity because, you know, they're roadside, so they, not all of them have a seed bank. So if we can boost that up, maybe we can improve that habitat quality. And just a, a quickly, like funding and partnerships. So we couldn't do this alone, obviously. So we have the Ontario Trillium Foundation that supported us for the last couple of years. Uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada is really interested in what we're doing. So they've funded the Southwestern portion. And we've just partnered with um, Highway 407. So it's a major toll road through Toronto. So uh, they've given us a number of uh, dollars to work with neighboring communities uh, to the north of the GTA or the greater Toronto area. So uh, a place where there's lots of opportunity for, for Monarch because they're traveling up and down that coast of uh, Lake Ontario. And that's it. So thanks for your time and your listening. Yeah. John. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's the latitude or just generally the fluctuations. 
Oh, sorry. Uh, John was just saying he, he's uh, in the, one of the Western provinces and he sees fluctuations in monarchs uh, from year to year. Um, I, I don't know that it's latitude too much. I think it's what's happening the, as to the population in general. My understanding is that you know they're, they're traveling up through Texas and all the, the US states, so they're hitting a lot of obstacles on their way up. Um, you know, maybe it's a drought in the spring and so they're not having those, those previous generations because it's like four or five generations uh, as they're making their way up to Canada. So yeah, we saw a, a really low year last year, but then we had a major windstorm come through in May, right, during the migration. So I think that could have set them back. Um, but then, you know, what, whatever happens in the spring can totally turn around by the fall because they've laid eggs again and they're going to go back again. So if we have a highly productive crop of eggs, then they're going to repopulate as they head south again. So it, it's one of those things about insect populations. It's hard to, to predict what's going to happen, right? So, but it's interesting, like in, I used to live in Calgary and uh, we saw almost no monarchs around. But Edmonton, which is to the north, always sees all kinds of monarchs. Uh, to me, I think it's the difference is it's a very arid place in Calgary. Edmonton's more lush and, you know, it's farm country. Um, so I think they just bypass. They're just like, let's go past Calgary. Let's get to Edmond. <laughs> but that's just, you know, my anecdotes. But and again, that data is from uh, citizen science. So it's just where people are observing monarchs. So it's entirely possible there are other places that we're just not uh, picking them up based on where people are. And we've got so many wide open spaces where people aren't seen very much in Canada, so, yeah. The, the mowing map, the very last one? Oh, yeah, so there's a, a reference on there. There's a, a paper that was um, done on that. Um, and there's numerous different sources, like I've seen 17% for Canada, and you know, 5% for here and there. So like, again, they're all estimates, but the short end of the story is that we know that we have a role, uh, um, something that we need to do on our landscape. And I should also say, it's not all just about monarchs, right? It's about a number of other species of pollinators. There's rusty patch bumblebee, all kinds of other species. So we're looking at this like an umbrella kind of situation where you know, we can provide habitat for insects, for birds, for small mammals, all kinds of creatures. So, yeah. Any other questions? All the way at the back. Definitely, yeah, and invasive species are, sorry. She was asking about invasive species, so um, yeah, we definitely have an active invasive species program in all of these sites. So we have a number of invaders from wild parsnip to um, Phragmites that are in a lot of our sites, uh, Canva thistle. So that's always a part of the, the program. Um, and that's why a lot of places spray. They go out in these big boom sprays and they spray all the roads every year, sometimes twice. So um, our, our idea is if we can spot spray, we can figure out where the most dense uh, in infestations are, where it makes the most sense to go out and actually spray these, um, then we can reduce the amount of chemicals and we can allow more habitat as well. And we have some partners who have adopted road programs and they have thousands of kilometers where citizens go out and dig out the wild parsnip just so that they don't have to spray. So I think that's a really cool approach. Um, and on that also the monitoring is showing that the places where boom spraying is happening, they're only having a mild reduction in weeds. So there's the trade off, right? You're spending a lot of money and a lot of uh, effort into spraying. Maybe you're not really getting the weed control that you need to, so we would like to have. So any other questions? I don't think there's any more questions. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Next, I'd like to introduce Michael Curran, ecologist with Abnova Ecological Solutions, and he'll be talking about ecological restoration practices for insect conservation within natural gas fields. Welcome, Michael. Here, 
this is the green button. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm going to talk about some of the recent research I've published from Wyoming's gas fields. Um, what you're looking at on this screen here is the edge of a reclaimed well pad next to a reference area of decadent old sagebrush. In this instance, we're using Rocky Mountain bee plant. That's that pink or purple flower that you're seeing. Um, some of the challenges we face in Wyoming, it is a really difficult place to reclaim or restore our ecosystems when they're disturbed. This picture comes from Pinedale, Wyoming. Pinedale averages between 39 and 52 frost-free days per year. Um, so less than two months of a, a true growing season. Um, it's classified as an eight to 11 inch precipitation zone. In reality, seven inches is a lot of precipitation up there. Uh, we have not really well-developed soils in, throughout a lot of Wyoming because it is such an arid and cold climate. Um, one of the major issues that we face with reclamation and restoration are invasive species. In this particular area, Halogeton glomeratus, it's a halophytic uh, invasive annual forb species. When these well pads are developed, this soil is stripped, stockpiled, stored usually for maybe one to three years, and then about 80, 75 to 80% of the initial construction goes into interim reclamation. Um, whereas a, a pipeline would, would go into almost 100% reclamation almost immediately. Um, in that stripping and stockpiling uh, practice, if there is a salt layer mixed in with the soil, um, we see a lot of that halogy and that halophytic species. Um, uh, some of our other issues that we have are cheatgrass. Um, we have a, a, the University of Wyoming actually just got a big grant to set up an institute called IMAGINE, the Institute for Managing Annual Grasses Invading naked Native Ecosystems. So pretty big issue. Um, um, I always look at reclamation or restoration as assisted succession. And what you're seeing here is this reference system of that old decadent sagebrush at the end. Um, one of the policies up in that Pinedale area where I'm going to be talking about is within five years, they're supposed to have 50% sagebrush cover. Uh, it's a really, really difficult challenge uh, when we're not getting wet years and because it is so cold up there. Um, what we used to see all the time are these seed mixes that are dominated by late seral species. And when we see that, what typically happens is we leave these sites very vulnerable to being invaded by weeds. Uh, so that um, initial slide, what they started using Rocky Mountain bee plant for, this is a native annual forb, is because it actually outcompetes halogen. and it wasn't initially put in there for pollinators or for insects or anything like that. It was because taking this successional concept the best way to outcompete these native or these invasive annual forbs seems to be with native annual forbs. And bee plant is one of the few native annual forbs that we can actually get seeds for at scale. Um, the Pinedale Anticline, they have 628 well pads ranging between five and 60 acres. Some of the other stuff we'll talk about is in the Jonah infill gas field where they have 2,100 5.3 acre well pads on average. So a little over 10,000 acres and roughly 80% of that is in reclamation. So it, it is very difficult for us to get, um, yeah, get, get native seeds and get these native annual seeds that really seem to set the stage for uh, later succession. The reason I'm gonna talk about insects today is because they're one of the few animal species that provide ecosystem services in all categories of ecosystem services. Mainly we see them as pollinators, but they're also major in biocontrol. Um, one of the problems we have in Wyoming is in the Western United States is this greater sage grouse. It's a threatened bird. Uh, it was petitioned for endangered species listing in 2015. It was not listed. Uh, the population numbers have been declining and they're expecting 
you know, any day now, probably within the next couple of years for that to be petitioned again. So I really look at insects as bird food and we'll talk about that as we go. I actually got my background working for Doug Ptolemy as an undergrad at the University of Delaware. Um, in 26, or 2006 to 2008, I was his field technician. Um, I came on right after he published a paper that you see um, in 2004, do alien plants reduce insect biomass? And what he found was convincingly non-native vegetation communities um, do not support insect biomass. Right after I graduated, he published this book, Bringing Nature Home, How to Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants. Um, I would consider this kind of the, the Bible for native gardening. Um, what we did in 2006 to 2008 was we were planting four Japanese maple versus four native maple, four Norway spruce next to four uh, native to the mid-Atlantic spruce with the 30 most common ornamental uh, plants in the mid-Atlantic. And we found things like a native white oak host 537 species of caterpillars where a uh, Eurasian oak hosts about 11 species of caterpillars. Uh, Japanese maple hosts, I think, seven species of caterpillar compared to the native maple, which is somewhere between 120 and 130. Um, after I left, Karen Burghardt was the first one to really quantify that when you have cul-de-sacs and houses are using native plants in their yards, you see a market increase in bird populations, in butterfly populations, um, which makes really intuitive sense, actually. And when I told Dr. Ptolemy I was going to Wyoming to pursue a graduate degree, he made me read this paper, Reproductive Success of Chestnut Colored Long Spurs in Native and Exotic Grasslands. And this paper, what it looks at is um, these birds that nest in crested wheatgrass monocultures versus in mixed grass prairies. And the, the birds in the crested wheatgrass monocultures are in the nest for between three and six weeks longer and leaving the nest at 9% lower body mass. So they're not only susceptible to predation by eagles, hawks, rodents, and things, they probably are set up to have lower fitness as adults. Um, presumably why they're in the nest longer in that non-native monoculture is because they're not getting the protein that they need. So again, um, why insects? B because they're, one of the reasons I study them, uh, besides the fact that they provide all these ecosystem services, is you can capture statistically valid sample sizes pretty rapidly um, compared to looking at other wildlife species. And they have been used as indicators um, for eco uh, yeah, ecological functionality. Um, what I looked at in this first study that came out in April of last year was I was looking at the plant vigor hypothesis, which suggests insects when having the choice between uh, young vigorous plants versus old decadent uh, woody leggy plants, they typically are choosing more the more vigorous plants. Um, I looked at some of this math flowering hypothesis work, which comes out of the ag literature. Um, basically, if, if you're planting um, sunflowers and a monoculture of corn, you're gonna have a market increase on pollinators. Um, so what I'm looking at is we have this monoculture of decadent old sagebrush, and then we have these five acre patches where we can um, really plant native flowers. Um, and I'm thinking, yeah, if, if we can get five acres of this beautiful pink flower next to a monoculture with really no flowers, we're probably gonna see more insects. Um, we also know a lot of insects avoid terpenoids which is produced by old sagebrush. So those are gonna be things like termites and maybe carpenter bees. Not a whole lot of, of stuff is expected to eat that old woody uh, shrubby material. And then one of the things that, that we know in rangelands is that roughly three quarters of the plants are pollinated by insects or they do better if, even if the, the plants that can be pollinated by wind uh, produce better when they have uh, insect pollination. But we don't have a great repository of what's out there. So I went and looked at these old sites that were three years old that were seeded just with grass species. Um, and then I looked at one year old sites that have this Rocky Mountain bee plant on them. And I compared the insect communities um, to the reference area. And what we found was in both instances, significantly more insect abundance and significantly higher insect richness um, on our reclaimed sites than our, our reference area. If you actually look at the Y axis there, you're seeing on these sites with bee plant about 150 insects per well pad location versus in the um, 
grassland community, you're looking more at about 50. So about three times more insects when we have native flowers uh, compared to native grasses. Um, then, because we didn't really know what was out there, I just put this stacked bar graph together. These pink lines are insects that we found on sites with bee plant, green or sites with grasses. Um, the brown is reference sites next to native grasses and the purple is reference sites next to the bee plant. Um, it was actually pretty interesting because now all these oil and gas companies out west are supposed to be putting pollinator habitat improvement plans in their applications for permits to drill. So before they even uh, punch a hole in the ground, they're supposed to tell the government that they have a plan to promote pollinator and wildlife habitat with their seed mixes. Um, one of the really interesting things we found, those chrysomylids, that um, fourth one down or fifth one down with that huge pink bar, those are leaf beetles uh, from weeks five to 10 in the sage grouse diet. That is the primary source of insect protein that uh, sage grouse chicks eat after hatch. Um, so that's actually a really good sign when we have this threatened species up there that, that we can increase um, one of its primary sources of food. And then some of the other interesting stuff, the cercopids and the cicadellids, these are these leaf hoppers. We find them more on these sites with grasses which really didn't shock me. I didn't know that they were gonna be out there, but when I found them, it's like, well, these are herbivorous plants that eat grasses. So of course, if we've got these islands of grasses, we would see them. Um, same thing in 2016, this is the second year we did this study. Um, similar patterns, again, we see those chrysomylids and uh, these uh, ligus bugs are the other things we find in really high numbers on these bee plant sites. And then those cicadellids, again, we find on those um, the, those grass sites. So the conclusions of that study is that we can get more insects on reclaimed sites. Reclaimed sites with flowering plants host more insects than reclaimed sites that are only seeded with grasses. Uh, in that instance, we found about 12 times more pollinating species. Um, so why did, does this really matter? Um, because yeah, if, if we have 10,000 acres of, of stuff to reclaim um, just in the Jonah field alone, and then we have you know, another six or 8,000 acres, 30 miles north of that in Pinedale, um, and 20,000 acres in the Wamsutter field in Wyoming. If, yeah, if we can actually get the native seed to grow the native flowers, we can have a really big impact on our insect communities. One of the things from that mass flowering hypothesis is always, um, every single one of them, if you look at the conclusion, will say, what this study found was when we have a mass flowering situation inside of a crop field, um, we find more pollinators, but this study is limited to the fact that we only looked at one point in the growing season with, you know, with sunflowers in a cornfield in Kansas or with oilseed rape in a soybean field in France. Um, and then they'll say, you know, probably the best thing to have for um, pollinator conservation is a spatial and temporal mosaic of flowers that are blooming at different times throughout the year. So, 2017 and 18, I moved down to the Jonah field where they use between 16 and 20 species of native seeds in their seed mix. Um, the reason why they would use 16 is if four species just are not available. There's usually six perennial forbs. There's that Rocky Mountain bee plant at about a pound per acre on these five acre sites, um, five or six species of grasses, and then usually, uh, yeah, four or five uh, species of shrubs. What this bee plant really does a nice job of is not only does it compete with halogen, it actually grows four to six feet tall in this sea of two to three foot sagebrush. So it almost acts as a living snow fence in the winter months and it retains all this moisture on these well pads. Um, by year two, you can actually see in that bottom picture there, a lot of that understory, that's in a one year old reclaimed site. By year two, that bee plant drops by about 50% and then year three, it's about 50% of that 50% and year four, it's basically gone. Um, it's a seed that needs disturbance. The only time I ever see it out there is in disturbed like rodent holes. So I'm thinking a bird's probably eating the seed, defecating it, and it will germinate at the edge of these uh, badger holes or um, yeah, little rodent holes. So it, it does spread some, but it, it definitely seems to need a disturbance, but it's, it's kind of nice because then what you see in year two and three are these um, blue flax, Western yarrow, um, Rocky Mountain penstemon, and all these perennial species that are, are coming in from that understory. And they're blooming usually late May to the early part of July. That bee plant starts blooming 
the middle of July through about Labor Day. Um, so this next study, we went out and looked at what's going on in the early season versus the late season. We find about we find significantly higher um, abundance and richness in the early season and significantly higher Shannon diversity. Um, we find about three times more insects on these sites with yarrow and flax. If you actually go to some work from a guy named Jim, Jim Kane from the USDA, um, out of all these seeds that are really commercially available, yarrow and flax don't, they do the least of promoting pollinators and, and insects. They're in almost every seed mix in the Western United States because they're like the two seeds that are almost always commercially available without weeds in them. Um, so another case, if we could get other seeds in our mix and, and have other things blooming when the yarrow and flax, I think we could have a, a bigger increase. Um, late season, we find 22 times more insects. Um, we find higher richness. Our Shannon diversity index was not significant. And that's because those chrysomillid beetles, if you look at that top right graph, we found about 800 of them on our sites with bee plant. We found none of them in our reference community. That screwed up our, that Shannon diversity index is a functionality of, of richness and evenness. So we don't really have an even community there. We have more species, but it's just so dominated by those leaf beetles. Um, but again, that's a, a good story for the grouse. Um, yeah, our conclusions from that study, we can find about three times more insects in these early season sites when flax and yarrow, uh, there is some penstem in there is some glow mallow in those blooms. Um, and then, yeah, these late seasons in the Jonah, we find almost 22 times more insects. Um, so yeah, so some of the take home messages is here is we can actually promote insect habitat through reclaiming our well pads uh, because we have so much disturbance in the Western US, this can be a, a key to conserving insects. Um, and ideally, eventually these birds will figure out that that's where their food is is hanging out. Um, so that that's something I plan to look at here in the near future. Um, and then yeah, one of the things I have on this last slide, a lot of these oil and gas companies now are in this ESG game. So environmental, social and governance where they have to submit the report card basically to their investment firms like BlackRock or Accenture. Um, saying if they're good stewards of the environment, they are more likely to get a loan. Um, one of the things I found is a lot of these companies have been focused on methane reduction. Um, and then there are problems with that. It's really hard to measure atmospheric carbon cycling. Um, it's hard to really account for that when you have a, a well pad company doing the exploration and a pipeline company shipping the gas. If the carbon is that leaking out of a pipeline or is it coming out of the well pad itself? Um, so when I actually spoke about this at a pipeline conference last year, um, somebody from the biggest pipeline company in the US came up to me and said, you know, biodiversity declines is this really big thing. And, and you're telling us that reclamation and restoration is way easier to account for with simple t-tests and bar graphs like I showed earlier than atmospheric carbon cycling. So um, for those folks in, in industry, um, I do think that seeding with native plants and especially seeding with native flowering plants is pretty much a low hanging fruit uh, to boost that environment part of your ESG report. Um, and yeah, with that, I think I have two minutes for questions. And real okay. quick, those publications are available on my website, it's abnovaecology.com. So if you're looking for them, I printed some out and they're, they're gone from my table, but um, you can download them. Okay, well, I think we maybe have time for one question. Sure. And I have this nice microphone and I saw a hand over here. Here we go. Yeah, thank you for that talk. I was just wondering if you consider native thistles in your seed mix, because I know that that's not um, the most popular choice, but um, they actually, you know, pollinators love them and uh, they do like disturbance right. as well. Unfortunately, no. Um, Canada thistle is considered a, a weed in most of Wyoming's counties. Na native thistles. Oh, yeah. But yeah, no, we. They, I don't ever see native thistles in the mix. Um, it, yeah, we're usually looking at yarrow, flax, glow mallow, penstemon, bee plant, um, several types of, of penstemon actually. Um, and then, yeah, that's something yeah, I, I actually like that idea quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I'll, I 
would not mind actually talking to an oil and gas company about that, but I, I don't see it. Okay, I think that's time. So thank you very much, thank Michael. You. Okay, next we have Natalie Melkinov. Natalie is the Plant and Insect Ecology Program Manager at the Desert Botanical Garden and University of Arizona. And she's going to be presenting Seeds for Monarchs and Pollinators at the Desert Botanical Garden. Welcome, Natalie. Hey everybody, you can hear me okay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, hey, um, I'm Natalie and I'm gonna talk to you about seeds for monarchs and pollinators at Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so there's a lot of great native plant materials work going on at Desert Botanical Garden, but I'm gonna focus mainly on a program that we call the Great Milkweed Grow Out. Um, and this project has three main parts, outreach and education, native plant propagation, and research. Um, so why are we talking about monarchs? Um, monarchs are kind of a great gateway to get people interested in conservation. Um, even people who aren't particularly conservation-minded, um, a lot of them are interested in butterflies. They love butterflies, they particularly love monarchs. Um, and so talking about monarchs with these folks can get them thinking about ecosystem health on a, um, a broader scale and about native plants and the importance of native plants. Um, conservation action for monarch butterflies is also really easy. It's easy to ask people to add some native milkweeds or some native nectar plants into their urban spaces. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but our project um, began focusing on urban spaces and we've sort of expanded out into wildlands areas as well. Um, and finally, we know that taking conservation action for monarchs benefits a whole host of other organisms, other insects, um, wildlife, and ecosystem health um, at a broad scale. So we sort of, as was mentioned earlier today, use monarchs as our umbrella and our, our gateway to get people thinking about these really important issues. Um, so probably really familiar to all of you in here, but just a few monarch basics to get us started. Um, monarch butterflies will only lay their eggs on milkweed and their caterpillars will only eat milkweed. This means milkweed's their host plant is essential for their life cycle. Um, in Phoenix, we also have the queen butterfly who um, also uses milkweed as its host. And um, you might notice that both monarch adults and caterpillars are brightly colored. So monarch caterpillars, when they eat milkweed, they ingest a toxin from the plant. It makes them distasteful to predators, and predators learn not to eat them again based on their, this warning coloration. Um, so this is a famous study by Lincoln Brower. You can see a blue jay here. These photos span about a 15 minute time period. So it ingests the monarch, it doesn't taste good, it vomits it back out. Um, it's presumably learned not to eat something that looks like that again. And why do we wanna do this work in Arizona? Um, one of the reasons is the great diversity of milkweeds in Arizona. So we have about 30 native milkweed species. They're found throughout the state. They all look a little bit different. They're all found in slightly different uh, ecoregions, and they all support monarchs and insects a little bit differently. We don't know a lot about that, but I'll talk about it a little bit more. Another reason to do this work in Arizona, generally when we talk about monarchs, we think about two flyways. The Western Flyway, which lives west of the Rocky Mountains and overwinters along the California coast, and the Eastern Flyway, which lives east of the Rocky Mountains and overwinters in central Mexico. And if you look at this map from Southwest Monarch Study, um, you'll see a bunch of little lines. All of these lines indicate an individual monarch butterfly that was tagged in one spot and then relocated later. Um, and if you look at the top two lines of text there, you'll see Arizona to Mexico, 24, Arizona to California, 28. So about even numbers of monarchs moving from Arizona to those overwintering spots on the coast of California and down to central Mexico. And this is pretty typical for what we see every fall migration. We see about even numbers of monarchs moving from Arizona to California and to Mexico. So any conservation action that we take in Arizona can impact both of these groups. Um, and then, as we know, monarchs are declining both the eastern and the western flyways um, with particularly extreme declines that we've seen in the west um, recently. So this is important conservation work for monarchs and, as we mentioned earlier, for that whole host of other organisms. 
Um, and monarchs are threatened by many things, as are other insects, loss of breeding habitat, loss of nectar plant habitat, pesticide use, natural disasters, climate change. Additionally, at overwintering grounds, they're threatened by things like deforestation and tree disease. Um, so talking about our native plant program a little bit, I'm gonna run through some of the steps of our program. I'm gonna show you uh, how we've gotten to where we are today and what we do with a lot of the plants and plant materials that we produce. Uh, so when we started this program in 2016, we kind of started with two main goals. We wanted to encourage people to plant monarch habitat in their urban spaces, and we wanted to do some research. We have you know, we knew we had a bunch of milkweeds in Arizona. We didn't know a lot about them, um, how they supported monarchs or other insects. Uh, we quickly realized that there wasn't a plant material available to do either of these things. We didn't have plants to use for research projects. We didn't have plants to uh, give people to encourage that urban habitat. So we started to grow our own. Um, and we started, and we still start mo mainly today, all of our, most of our plants are produced from wild collected seed or from seed produced on site. And I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, so this wild seed collection, as I'm sure we all know, has its own challenges, and particularly with milkweeds in the West. These milkweeds grow in small patches, sometimes they're hard to find, um, and it takes repeated trips often to find the population and to get out there at the right time in order to make a successful collection. Um, and sometimes we'll end up with a good number of seeds, enough to sort of start our research and development on how to grow these plants, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes, you know, we'll get two seeds in one year, so the next year we'll get five, <laughs> and um, it's a slow process to work on these propagation protocols that are part of our goal of this program. Um, so we really wanna, we wanna grow these plants for our own projects to get out into our own communities and wildlands projects. And we also wanna encourage other people in the state and in the Southwest to grow these plants. So we do a lot of research and development to develop these propagation protocols and to share that information out as best we can. Um, we also do, along with this, germination and emergence testing. So when we started this program in 2016, Desert Botanical Garden didn't have a seed lab facility, but we opened and built a new one in 2019. Um, so that houses our seed lab and our small seed bank on site. And it also allows us to do some more in-depth germination and emergence testing. So now with every seed accession that we're growing out, we're also um, running germination tests in our seed lab and emergence tests in our greenhouse. And this information just really helps bolster our propagation protocols and refine our propagation methods. And again, share that information out. And then grow outs. Um, so we get to the point where we are producing plants. We produce a small number of plants each year, between three and 5,000 plants. Um, certainly not as many as some of the other programs I've heard here throughout the meeting, but this is a small initiative um, and just one of many things happening at the garden. And these numbers allow us to supply a lot of plants via donation to schools, community centers, urban projects, and also to have the space and time to, to do specific um, small-scale grow-outs for wildlands projects, and also to have plants available for our research. Um, and then we also do some seed amplification on site. So some of these plants that we're producing or seeds that we're producing also go into seed amplification beds or plots. Um, so the we have some, some beds on site there, and we also have a milkweed plot, so it doubles as a seed collection field, but also a research plot. And volunteers, I would be remiss if I didn't mention volunteers in my talk today. Um, Desert Botanical Garden as a whole is really reliant on volunteers, and we have a great um, enthusiastic group of volunteers, and this program in particular really relies on their uh, help and their knowledge um, and their passion. Um, this is a primarily grant-funded program, so staff time is limited, and volunteers have their hands in every step of seed cleaning, propagation, grow-outs, et cetera. Um, they're really invaluable to our work and certainly wouldn't be anywhere near where we are today without them. So some challenges and successes. Um, 
challenges. As I mentioned, we're working with wild collected seed. It's often hard to even get enough seed to start uh, developing the protocols that we need. Um, and then it takes us, can take many years to get to a place where we can produce plants um, in numbers that we, we need for projects and for research. We have unknown propagation protocols, so there's a lot of tri trial and error in our development. You know, we kill a lot of plants <laughs> um, as we're trying to learn. And there are many species to choose from, so many native milkweeds, but also many native uh, um, nectar plants and other plants that support insects that we're trying to grow and, and get out into a variety of urban and wildlands projects. Some successes. Uh, since 2016, we've produced over 25,000 plants, and most of them have been distributed by a donation to community and wildlands projects. Um, and we've completed over 30 habitat projects. We've certainly seen increased public interest and more interest in native plants. So we, we have people reaching out to Desert Botanical Garden asking about milkweeds on a regular basis. They come to the garden, they come to our plant sales, they come to our facilities asking specifically for these plants. Um, they know a lot more than they did in 2016, and we certainly consider that a win. And then we've been able to develop a lot of propagation protocols and share them out. So some of our partnerships for habitat restoration and enha enhancement, um, like I mentioned, we work with a wide variety of community um, and wildlands partners. So these include schools, community centers, nonprofits, government agencies, and tribal partners. And the way that our program is structured allows us to offer a lot of plants um, at a really low cost or as donations. So it truly really encourages getting this habitat out, um, which is one of the main goals of, of our program. And then finally, we use a lot of these plants for research. So I'm gonna show you some examples of some of the things that we, we can also do with these plants. Um, so we're answering a lot of questions about how native milkweeds and other plants support insects in the Southwest. So we can do things like this um, because we have, these are two native milkweed species, um, Asclepius angustifolia or Arizona milkweed and Asclepius linaria or pine needle milkweed, two native species in Arizona that um, have a slight range overlap. Um, we can do things like oviposition preference and larval performance trials. So we, if you look at the, the graph with the monarch on it, that shows you that a female monarch chose to lay eggs on Arizona milkweed over pine needle milkweed, and correspondingly, her larvae did better on Arizona milkweed than pine needle milkweed. Um, so because we have plants, we can do this type of research and this leads us to really important recommendations about creating habitat, especially um, thinking about urban areas where these species might overlap or out in their wildland ranges where these species are overlapping. What, what plants do we want to prioritize for um, restoration and how do we want to communicate that to our partners? We can also do things like this. Um, this graph shows you observations in one month, the month of April at Desert Botanical Garden of almost 3,000 arthropods from at least 57 families on four different species of milkweed. Um, so we ran this study to look at how milkweeds support other insects. If you're adding milkweeds into your habitat, what other beneficial insects or pollinators are you supporting? Um, and we can see things like this. We thought maybe there would be a difference between those four species. Um, turns out there wasn't. <laughs> the four species of native milkweed that we had in this trial um, didn't differ significantly in terms of the number of insects found on each, but they did differ significantly in terms of um, the different insect families that were found on each species. And finally, we know that the Southwest is getting hotter and drier, and we want to explore how these um, climate impacts are going to influence these interactions that we're seeing between insects and plants. Um, so we have a couple facilities on site to do this research. Um, this big field that you see here is the milkweed field that I showed earlier. So this is a, um, it's now full of milkweed. <laughs> um, it allows us to collect a lot of milkweed seed on site, but also is set up with um, 37 distinct plots that can be controlled individually for irrigation. So it allows us to run some drought treatments and see how um, plant health and plant defense characteristics might change under a drought scenario. The other photo is a relatively new 
um, experimental heating array that we've constructed at the garden. This allows us to raise leaf temperature of plants under that array by three to four degrees Celsius as compared to plants in the uh, control plot, which is just behind that plot in this photo. Um, so even just a few degrees difference, a few degrees warmer, something like a warmer spring or a, a more intense episodic heat wave can influence plant health and how plants are inter in interacting with insects. Um, so we want to get at some of these differences and these really important climate questions, particularly in our region. Um, so this work is funded and supported by many, many partners. So thank you to all of them and thank you to all of you for your time. Any questions for Natalie? One over here. Thank you. I'm a little blinded. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going out into the Yeah, um, we haven't as much. We, Could you repeat the question? Oh, sorry, yes. The question was, are we growing out any non-native milkweed species to do any comparisons? Um, not currently. We, I think at some point we'll do a comparison with the tropical milkweed and our native species because that one is pretty popular in, in our urban spaces, but we haven't done it yet. Over there. Would you like to speak up or wait for the microphone? She's going to meet me in the middle. Okay. <laughs> Get some steps in. Hi, I was just wondering if your uh, the host plant caterpillar results were available anywhere. Um, yes, the first gra the first graphs that I showed between um, with opposition preference and level performance that one is published. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for more questions. Do we have one? Yeah, I was curious if you've experimented with uh, hand pollination of any of the milkweed species you work with. Um, no, we haven't done any hand pollination. We do have a few that um, those seed amplification beds, we're trying to, to put some in those beds that are a little bit harder to do wild collection of. Either the populations are hard or they don't seem to set fruit as easily. So I, we're kind of setting it up for being able to do some hand pollination out there. Um, we have Sclepius albicans growing out there, one of our native species that seems to be have really low um, fruit set. So I think we'll probably try it with that one, but we haven't done it yet. And one more. Is there another hand? Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Okay. Our next and final speaker is Mark Feely. Mark, I know you're with Ernst. You're a horticulturalist with Ernst Conservation Seeds, and he'll be presenting on dietary needs of pollinators and other beneficial insects. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here and not running out. I know the temptation was there. I would have. The objectives of the, my presentation here are to increase the understanding that uh, insect pollination is accomplished by bee and non-bee species, and to understand that native bees do not have identical windows of activity, and also to increase the understanding of the dietary needs of juvenile and adult bees, butterflies, and beneficial insects, and to increase the understanding of the plants that support them. So let's start out with, who does our cold weather pollination? Throw out an answer. Any others? Cold temperature. Flies. Flies. 
Flies are important when pollinate are important pollinators when temperatures are cold, elevation is high, or latitude is high. Are all orders of bees active throughout the growing season? I hear a no. Do I have any yeses? The no's are correct. If you look at this uh, chart here, you'll see different colors representing different bee genera. You'll notice some are very active in the early part of the season and when, and this is uh, up in Pennsylvania, and, and when July comes around, they're done. And you look at the abundance of those bees at different windows. Again, some, each is its unique uh, presence. So let's talk about what do adult bees eat. Most bees are nectar generalists. It does not matter if the host plant is native. Nectar is their source of carbohydrates and secondary metabolites. Ah, now we're getting to something important. Secondary metabolites can be important to bee health. This is a bumblebee leaving its pharmacy. The plant is turtle head, Shalom glabra. Turtle head has an alkaloid in its nectar called catapult that helps the bee deal with issues uh, associated with mites. If you read up on, um, there's a Dr. Adler at University of Massachusetts Amherst. She, her lab is doing some research where they're looking at how sunflower pollen helps uh, bumblebees deal with a protozoan uh, parasite of uh, the bumblebee. So what do bee larvae eat? Well, the primary source of carbohydrates is nectar, and that's combined with pollen, which is a source of protein, lipids, vitamins, and carbohydrates. And here's the neat part. Each bee species feeds its larvae pollen with a pro, uh, uh, sorry, let's get this right, with a specific ratio of proteins to lipids. It is best if the pollen source is a native species. Did you know this? The protein to lipid ratio of pollen varies by plant species, and the ratio needed varies by bee species. Few flowers have the correct protein to lipid ratio for given bee species, and bees compensate by, by, for this by visiting many different plants to get the right basket of what they need to feed. If lipid levels are too high, they will be toxic to bees. This data is from a paper published by Anthony Valdo from Penn State. He's part of the center, he was part of the Center for Pollinator Research there. The diamond shapes on there represent three different bee species, and the circle shapes at the end of the lines represent uh, the different uh, plant families, protein to lipid ratios. Again, you don't see a perfect alignment of the plants with the insects, so they have to go to different hosts to get the right market basket. Now there are exceptions. Santa Heba Carpa Wild Santa has pollen. It's only accessible to bumblebees. They have to stick their face into the flower and buzz it by disengaging their wings and uh, they get a vibration and it causes the flower to let loose with the pollen onto the bee's face. The protein to lipid ratio of this species pollen is nearly identical to the ratio needed by bumblebees. Is a plant equally attractive to a bee throughout the day? Hmm. What do you think? Correct. Some plants are more attractive in the morning, some are fairly attractive throughout the day, some more so in the afternoon. Okay, the amount of time a bee spends its flower will vary by species and, and uh, how much it'll spend throughout the day. So going back, are all species equally attractive to bees? Well, the example of Senehiva carpa tells us no. Bee size and tongue length determine which species pollen and nectar are available. Some bees collect pollen from many plant species and families. They're said to be polylectic. Some from a limited number of families or species, they're said to be oligolectic. For species of bees, they're oligolectic. The family that is most common 
that they're most specific to is the Asteraceae. So it's very important to have Asteraceae in your landscape. And others, other bees are specific to a single species. They would be said to be monolectic. So let's look at a few examples here. Uh, this is a bicolor stripes, green uh, striped sweat bee. It forages on many plant families that have short corolla. Um, then you go to the pure gold green sweat bee, forages on many plant families and occasionally licks, um, lands on people to lick their sweat the last one didn't. And then we have the eastern bumblebee, many families. And again, the ligated um, furrow bee, many species. However, here we are at the longhorn bee. Hey, do you notice the footprints? Notice the pollen footprints in this, yeah. This is a longhorn bee, and it only forages on members of the aster family. Then we look over here at the cuckoo bee, and it forages on many plant families. All right. A little item of trivia here. Butterflies move pollen more efficient, or less efficiently than bees, but they move it over a greater distance. And did you know that butterflies smell with their antenna and mouths, but taste with their feet? Okay, so we're, we're well aware that monarchs, for example, have to eat the leaves of milkweeds, and the adults primarily consume nectar. That's not anything terribly new to us. As adults, uh, we see them nectaring on milkweeds, asters, sunflowers, liatris, monardas, goldenrods. So pre predominantly asters, uh, members of that asteraceae, I should say, milkweeds and, uh, and the mints. Are all milkweed species equally good for monarch butterflies? Or equally attractive, let me put it that way, I should have said that. Well, the last presentation showed something. In Northwest Pennsylvania, a few years ago, we had about 3,000 uh, monarch butterflies landing on one of our flowers right next to a milkweed field. About uh, five times in the last 25 years, I could have gone out, and if you said we need to find a, cr a chrysalis for a thousand classrooms in the county, we could have done it. Now we grow swamp milkweed, butterfly milkweed, and common milkweed, but almost exclusively, I will find chrysalis on swamp milkweed easily. I seldom find them easily on the other two milkweed species we grow. Now in contrast, and, and swamp milkweed is on uh, the left and common milkweed is on the right there. Um, common milkweed is the favored host in central Pennsylvania. Kind of interesting. Another li little item of trivia for you uh, that we find with uh, milkweeds, and you'll have to watch your own to see if you notice it. The fragrance is very strong during the middle of the day, or when the, when the sun's up there pretty good. But what we notice is that when you're starting, the sun's starting to go down, still pr plenty bright out, but there's not much light, there's not much fragrance. And the entomologists tell me that's because the plants have evolved to not waste their energy trying to attract pollinators when they're not as active, and indeed they're not as active at that time of day. Uh, we're gonna talk about some beneficial insects real quick, so uh, wasp. This is great gold digger wasp. They feed on insect pests such as, or sorry, plant pests such as uh, crickets and katydids, and they forage on species like uh, mountain mint for nectar. There's, a, there's another wasp, and it, uh, Bicerides. Bicerides, like this one, will nectar on mountain mint, and then it goes in search of its prey, which in its case happens to be stink bugs. It'll find a stink bug, sting it to paralyze it, take it back to its nest. There's catacombs down the ground, because it's ground nesting. It puts a paralyzed prey 
into the catacomb with an egg on it. Then it puts additional two, one, two, three additional uh, insects there, sealed it off, the egg hatches and eats its way through these paralyzed insects and comes out and repeats the cycle. Then we have our surfid flies and tachinid flies. This is a surfid fly. I love this little guy. Um, they have to eat 400 maggots, or sorry, the maggots of this have to eat 400 aphids before reaching maturity. The enemy, my enemy is my friend. Aphids are my enemy. And adults forage on nectar for uh, energy and, or, uh, and, and pollen for proteins, lipids, and vitamins. By the way, the way that they eat pollen is they hurl on it, they puke on it, and then they drink it up like a Slurpee. Mmm, yum. You eat your way, it eats its way, you know? Mm. Okay, what are some good host plants for surfing and tachinid flies? Well, this is kind of an East Coast bias, I'm sorry, or Eastern of the Rockies bias, but uh, you're looking at things like uh, heath aster, rattlesnake master, bergamots, mountain mints, sumac, uh, golden rods, and golden alexanders, okay? And so now we're at our tips here. We are get, getting close to time. This is wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Timing's halfway decent here. So I've got some tips for you for uh, formulating seed mixes for pollinators. Continuity of bloom from as early to as late in the growing season as possible. After all, do we really want to go to a smorgasbord and find out there's nothing there because we arrived at 1030 and they took everything off at 10 and then they put it out again at 11? That doesn't work very well, you know? Come on, we want food from early in the season to late in the season because remember, some of the bees aren't there the whole season. We need overlap of bloom. We need three or more species in bloom per season. And here's the big part, five or more plant families and 26 or more flowering species. By having that diversity of plant families, you're providing diversity of floral structures. And that also has its benefits to supporting pollinators. And then again, you need to host plants for uh, specialist species. Should you include uh, grasses in your pollinator mixes? Yes, because rodents will make holes, dig burrows underneath grasses, and then eventually some of the ground nesting bees will come to occupy those. All right. Let's take some questions. Questions? The caterpillars were, oh, that's loud. Uh, Chris, listening up on uh, milkweed, different milkweed species, do you think that has more to do with the structure of the plant and the ability for them to get out and hang versus no, because, the food source? Because again, in, in central Pennsylvania, I, 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 should, I should clarify it on this. We have places where all three species are growing in within the distance of, from walking from this end of the room to that end of the room, all equally accessible, same thing in State College, Pennsylvania, in Central Pennsylvania, and it's on different species. Same exact plants. I just, uh, I've, I've got some milkweed production. We're actually planting refugia rose in, so mm -hmm. they, and we're putting actually litris in a couple of the species you had, so I was, I'm liking my selection so far. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because you could plant one and you think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be supporting milkweeds, or sorry, monarchs. Maybe it doesn't like the species you have for that location. And quite honestly, that, that it's such a fascinating thing that it's not real straightforward. It's like, okay, why this one? I'm just not sure. There, yep. Have you looked at uh, pollinator use of grass pollen resources at all? The, they'll use that. But it's, it's not as, uh, I believe it's not as significantly important as having the flower pollen. I know that when I'm talking to our entomologist at Penn State, they, they seem very focused on the, the flower pollen. Now, again, they will use grass pollen, I, honeybees in particular well, but uh, I don't know with the native bees how much they use it. They, that has, that's a good question, I'll have to text them here at the end of this. 
Any other questions? Oh, hey, uh, if you look at, uh, I, I did put a whole bunch of references related to my presentation today on the Whova, so feel free to look those up. Also, if you snapped a shot of my uh, thing there earlier, the QR code, uh, you can reach out to me and, and feel free to talk to me later here. Um, so I got a question. Yeah. I'm in California and I am planning a pollinator project in an already established native perennial grassland. So I want to have the most minimal impact on the native species as possible and I don't want to clear a bunch of land. So I'm wondering if you have suggestions. I was considering 100 square foot patched planting areas and kind of a grid along the prairies or what do you think would be? I have heard nothing to suggest how spacing will uh, be for the positive or negative for the butterfly. However, from a plant standpoint, mm -hmm. what we see in Pennsylvania is if you, you, it's the, if you have your plants too close together with butterfly milk, you get, get cercospora leaf spot that will eventually kill the plants. If you are too dense with Asclepius incarnata, you get aphid problems that decimates the plants. So in general, I, I kind of like a little more spacious situation than, than tight together. How tight is too tight? How far is too far? It, that I couldn't give you tight numbers on. Thanks. By the way, if you want any tips on collecting uh, milkweed seed on small volumes where it's not got fuzz on it, let's talk later. Other questions? Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Mark, and I'll echo what he said. Thank you all for being here. Uh, that's the end of this pollinator session, but there is a continuation. There are two more pollinator talks after the break, and those are gonna be in Banneker. So, thank you.